Good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Jo Ebert, and I'm welcome all of you to this is our this our third of four in our series on Beyond Voting. Um, our intention with this series is to um, discuss topics beyond voting, as the title suggests, uh, ways that we can all be informed and also be active in promoting a healthy democracy. Uh, so our, we open the series at the end of April with the subject of the 2020 census. Uh, the second was on ways that individuals can help get out the vote for uh, this year and beyond. And tonight we're focusing primarily on a couple of topics from Voters Not Politicians. So we're going to go through the, uh, the trivia questions. We'll go th through these fairly quickly, see how you did. And Jane, you might wanna unmute everybody here because people can give answers if they choose. What event resulted in the first widespread use of non-in-person voting for an American presidential election. Any guesses there, anyone? Civil War. Civil War? Civil War, that's exactly right. Approximately 150,000 of the 1 million Union soldiers voted absentee in the 1864 presidential election. Next, what candidate spent his entire campaign budget buying liquor for 391 voters? Does that year give anyone a hint? Some of you are muted. If you have the answer, maybe uh, raise your hand and we'll unmute you or unmute yourself. I cannot unmute everybody at once. But you can unmute yourselves. No guesses, anyone? George Washington. <laughs> yes, George Washington bought liquor. Next, these were fill in the blank. Congress set a uniform day for presidential elections in 1845 as the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. This allowed people to observe the Sabbath travel to vote because a lot of people had to travel you know traveling even a short distance and of course took a lot longer than today and return home by wednesday which was market day um, in an agrarian society another interesting tidbit here is that anybody know why it's the first tuesday after the first monday i see kevin's hand up i'm gonna ask that i think i know but i'll see if anyone else knows Anyone else? It forces yeah. it not to be on the first, which is a holy day in some religions. And what holy day is that? All Saints Day. All Saints Day falls on November 1st. Was that your answer, Kevin? Well, the other, actually, the other reason I, I heard is that um, in most uh, small businesses and uh, tradesmen did their accounts on the first of the month. Uh, and so you wouldn't want election day to fall on the first of the month. That is also correct. Yes. Yeah. So they, they, exactly what Kevin just said, and then Keith's answer about the first Tuesday after the first Monday means the election will never fall on November 1st. Um, so that's All Saints Day and um, the closing of the books for a lot of businesses. So very good. We got a sharp crowd here tonight. Now this, I like this one a lot. Okay, this voting machine, Pat, the first lever voting machine patented by Jacob Myers. He said this device was needed to prevent what? Voter fraud. Voter fraud. Any other answers, anyone? Stop women from voting. <laughs> <laughs> Rascal dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so Keith, yeah, you're right. He referred to it as rascal dumb. Next, what is significant about August 20th, 2020? It's 100 years after the 19th Amendment. Correct. Oh. The 100 year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment 
granting most women the right to vote. And we say most because at that point, Japanese people could not become naturalized citizens, so they could not vote. Um, and until 1952, neither could Asian Indians. Native Americans were granted citizenship rights in 1924, but many states prohibited them from voting. Until 1961, residents of DC could not vote. Starting in 1961, they could, excluding African Americans. And then in 1965, we had the Voting Rights Act, which guaranteed voting for all citizens of voting age. <clears throat> and speaking of legal changes that granted people the right to vote, this just happened on Sunday. I wanted to share this with you quickly. On Sunday, a Sunday of a holiday weekend, no less, a federal judge ruled that former felons in the state of Florida cannot be barred from voting for owing court fines or fees that they are unable to pay. This ruling sets the stage for thousands of Floridians to register to vote and strikes down parts of a Florida law that required residents with felony convictions to pay off all of their legal financial obligations before casting a ballot, which in essence is a poll tax. This U.S. District Court Judge Robert Hinkle wrote in his decision that this order holds that the state can condition voting on payment of fines and restitution that a person is able to pay, but cannot condition voting on amounts a person is unable to pay or on payment of taxes, even those labeled fees or costs. So yay, Florida, yay, Judge Robert Hinkle, who did that on Sunday of a holiday weekend. Okay, next, before we introduce our speakers tonight, we want to do a quick update on the census because the census is such an important foundation for redistricting. Um, on the charts that you see on the screen right now, what you see is where we were at on April 28th when we first did the presentation on the census. We had Oakland County census leaders here who talked about that. And then where we are today, um, the data gets updated once a week. So this is data as of May 26th. Um, Michigan overall is at 66.8% response at this point. Um, Michigan ranks fourth among the 50 states. And this is interesting. The top four in this order are Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, and the fifth is Illinois. Um, so there's something about this cluster of states. Um, obviously, we have a we have a lot more work to do, um, but we're 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 fourth in the country at this point. And for Michigan to be in that position when we were one of the first states to shelter in place, and it has remained longer than a lot of other states, um, kudos to all the census workers who are doing this work and and everybody who's responding. Um, you see a county by counties, uh, we listed here counties that a lot of our church members live in. Um, and then likewise for the cities that you see here displayed on the left. Um, one of the surprises here is Bloomfield Hills, which is at 67.3%. It's lower than a lot of the other cities. And there was some discussion on a call this week in Oakland County about why that might be. So there's some, um, some work being done to address what they think is going on there in Bloomfield Hills. Um, and then um, some special attention being paid to uh, cities, counties, villages, and so on that are below 70% at this point. So we wanted to kind of keep this in front of you. The census deadline is October 31st. That got, it got extended because of all the shelter, in, shelter at home. Um, and for any more information, you can go to the website you see listed here in the lower left corner, 2020census.gov. And if you would like information that you can use to help publicize to your family, your friends, your community, encouraging people, reminding people on the importance of completing the census, um, you can contact me, you can contact Jane O'Neill, um, who is also on this call, and um, we'll get the information out to you. 
Any questions on that, everybody, before we go on? Mary Jo, did they did they say that the goal overall for the census was eighty percent participation? Um, well, the eighty percent is for self response. So this phase where people are going online, yeah, and our I had a percentage for that of of hmm. of course so far the number of people that have responded for Michigan have been responding primarily online. Um, and so for this first phase, they're hoping to get everybody to 80% and then they go into the phase where they really are going to go out to people's homes. Because uh, they really want to get as close to 100% as possible. Any other questions? No, okay. Well, next we are uh, we're pleased and we are appreciative of our two guest speakers who are joining us tonight from the Voters Not Politicians team. Uh, Voters Not Politicians was founded as a ballot initiative to end gerrymandering in Michigan. In November of 2018, 61% of Michigan voters supported the redistricting reform amendment, also known as Proposal 2 to put the power to draw election district maps in the hands of voters and not politicians. Um, I was a volunteer on that campaign. Um, there are several other, vo other volunteers on, who are with us tonight um, who just went out there and did this work. It was a very, very well-run campaign. It was the, the best ballot initiative campaign I've seen so far. So kudos to the organizing team um, who, who made that happen. Um, but that campaign success inspired an ongoing voter-led pro-democracy political reform movement in Michigan. Um, to this day, thousands of volunteers are engaged, empowered, and committed to do more to strengthen our democracy. So the first person I'd like to introduce tonight is Kim Murphy Kovalec. Kim is a volunteer and project a volunteer and project manager for Voters Not Politicians. She came to nonprofit work after careers as a small business owner and nurse. Kim served as a volunteer regional field director in the Proposal 2 campaign and now works to engage volunteers and grassroots community leaders around the state to implement the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. She is committed to using her organizing skills to produce change that lifts all Michiganders. So with that, we'll open to Kim, and Kim is going to give us an update on Voters Not Politicians' current activities. Thanks, Mary Jo. Um, it's really nice to see some familiar faces and names here tonight. It's wonderful. I love to see volunteers uh, like in the wild, so to speak. Um, oh, great. There's my face. Yeah, here we go. I had a, I had a Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> you get to see more of your own face, Kim. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so I do want to first update everybody about um, implementing the commission. So the deadline to apply to be a commissioner is June 1st. There is still time. We are working in um, traditionally underserved communities directly and uh, just virtually now since the since the pandemic um, has started. We're conducting virtual application workshops and we have volunteer notaries who are working, I mean, from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. They have appointments scheduled with, with people who wouldn't otherwise be able to access free notary services. And we are just trying to hit that out of the park right now. Um, so if you are considering applying to be a commissioner, it's not too late. I encourage you to do so. You can go right to the Secretary of State website. You can go right to our website, votersnotpoliticians.com slash apply and it will walk you through the process step by step it's a really it's a beautiful website um and i'm happy to take any questions about that later on but really i think that this group probably would have already applied if, if they wanted to so i want to talk briefly about the next stage which is community mapping we're working with princeton the princeton gerrymandering project to develop a mapping tool that can be used by anybody who has access to the internet 
Um, and we're also developing a paper and pencil tool that can be used by anybody. So this tool will be used by people all over Michigan to interact with the commission and they'll be um, walked through a brief process that will allow them to draw the boundaries of their own community. Um, and then they can submit that map to the commission itself. The commissioners, as I'm sure some of you already know, are constitu constitutionally mandated to hold 10 public meetings across the state before they draw their maps. And then after their maps are drawn, they have to hold another five meetings. So, and during those first 10 meetings, we really need the public um, participation to be robust. Uh, we need people to supply testimony about what their community boundaries are. Um, and, and in many cases, we would like to give them a tool so that they can actually submit a map so that what the commission is getting, um, the maps that the commission is getting as testimony are consistent. Um, the California commissioners reported getting maps in the form of testimony in the form of songs, um, maps drawn on napkins, and all kinds of different programs. So one of the goals that we have is, if possible, we would like to make it as, as uh, consistent as we can so that the commission can use those and can compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. We know we're not gonna reach any, everybody, just like we haven't reached everybody that we wanted to, to get them to apply to be a commissioner, um, but that is our, our goal and we're starting on that right now. So, um, apply to the commission. Please look for more updates about community mapping very shortly. We're going to start that this summer and you know please sign up to volunteer to help out. That would be a great place for everyone to jump in. So um, is there any other are there any other updates in particular that you want to hear Mary Jo or can I talk about our census work for just a few minutes? Um, go ahead and talk about your census work. Okay. We've been doing as an organization some census phone banking and we have our goal is to make 30,000 calls and we have done uh, over 24,000 so far, mostly into Southwest Michigan. Our last 6,000 are in the city of Detroit and Mary Jo, I can get you a link and if anybody here would like to sign up to phone bank for the census, we'll directly calling um, hard to count districts or precincts in Detroit trying to get people to respond to the census. This is really important work. You can sign up to make 30 calls, which takes about an hour or as many as you want. We have uh, one person who has made um, 600 calls, you know, so you can give as little time or, or as much time as you like or as you have available. Um, I do want to tell you too that I just heard that the census has begun field work again in full hazmat gear. And I don't, I can't even imagine what that would be like. Um, so at this point, it's, it's rough. It's rough. And if we can reach more people by phone, then that'll make it easier for field workers. You know, knocking on the door in, in a, a full gear in the summer does not sound like a pleasant experience. Right. Um, so at this point, I want to introduce Kevin Deegan Kraus. So he's, oh, go ahead, Jane. I see your hand up. Jane, you're muted. I know. Um, I'm wondering, is there a link that you could we could put in the chat box so people could uh, sign up for that? I will, yeah. Once, once Kevin starts his presentation, okay. I'll jump over and get that link. Yeah, that would be great. There's more, as many people as we have calling as possible is amazing. Yeah. Um, so Kevin is going to talk about our new Vote Safe campaign in which we are advocating that, that ballots are mailed to every registered voter in advance of these next two elections during this pandemic. And first of all, Kevin Deacon Kraus um, has been involved with Voters Not Politicians since the beginning. In fact, our very first informational slide deck was lifted from him, he created it. And he has had a big hand in, in every educational piece that we have created since then, um, because he's just amazing. So with that, I'm gonna give it over to Kevin and then I can help answer questions afterwards as well as, as Kevin. Aww. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, so Mary Jo, do you mind um, if I, you could share a screen and then I can put the slides up? Um, okay. If that's possible. If not, we can work around it. But Yeah, I think all we need to do is make you a co-host. Okay. Which you already are. Oh, great. Yeah. How about this? Everybody see democracy on there? We yeah. do. 
Yay. Okay, good. So um, uh, let me just say thank you to Kim and thank you, Mary Jo. And thank you to everybody for, for doing this. I will try and uh, um, be economical in use of time so that you can all um, get back to the lovely evening that's going on outside. Um, let me start with a, with a bunch of caveats. The first one is that we've been having a little internet trouble. So if, if it gets wonky or things start to sound, you can't hear me fully, just let me know by the chat window. And Kim and I have a kind of backup plan. So we'll, we'll make that work. Um, the second is that um, none of my neighbors appear to have taken COVID as a sign from, from the almighty that they should be mowing their lawn at least <laughs> twice a day. Um, so um, if, if you get some noise from the outside, um, that's it. And just, just let me know that way. I've got the chat window up. So if you've got questions or other things, I can't, when I've got the screen up for sharing, I can't see everybody. Um, so instead of raising your hand, just send me something in the chat window. And uh, if, it, if you're not being able to hear me or if you've got questions, just let me know that way. Um, the third caveat is just that um, this is the first time that, that we've actually done this uh, slide presentation. We've been, uh, voters not politicians have been working on this for a while, um, but in a way you're the premier that always brings certain dangers with it uh, because it might not be quite ready for prime time. So there's no nicer audience than the one that I have in front of me. Uh, so I'm sure it won't be an issue, but I just want to let you know that um, if, if there are any sort of technical difficulties or problems, we're, we're still working on that. And it reflects my inability and not the organization itself. Um, so let me just start, really what I, all I want to talk to you about is, uh, I want to talk to you about voting and how to make voting safer uh, for all of us uh, during the, the coming election seasons in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. And a lot of what I'm going to say to you is probably stuff that you already know. And we actually encountered this quite a bit with the gerrymandering presentations that we did. Uh, a lot of what we do when we do these presentations isn't to tell you stuff you don't already know. It's really to sort of give you quick and easy formulations for telling people about these things when you go out and talk to others. Because you really, all of you are opinion leaders. You're the kind of people that others turn to when they make their decisions. Uh, and so sometimes having a sort of quick, easy, pithy way to talk about something uh, helps in those kinds of conversations. So really, you know, if, if there is new stuff in here for you, that's great. And I, I'm glad to, to do a little bit of teaching, but really it's a kind of packaging that I want to talk to you about. Um, and then also, I really want to encourage you to get involved in some very particular ways. So that's the, that's the big picture. Um, democracy is, is, is what, we, what we live by and uh, sometimes what we take for granted. Uh, and at the core of democracy really is, let me get over to this, it really is voting. Uh, and uh, that's actually the thing that I study most closely. I teach at Wayne. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I really work on are elections and voting. So this, this issue is really close to my heart. I'm really uh, pretty excited and, and passionate about this. Uh, and I wish it hadn't taken a, a global pandemic to get us moving on some of this stuff, but it did. Here we are. And uh, um, so it's really a good thing that we're talking about it right now. Pretty obvious that voting is an act that does not easily respect social distancing. I mean, if you just think about the particular interactions that are here and the different people touching other people and things touching other people in places where uh, things like a, a pandemic could spread, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, and no matter what you try and do, it's not going to be necessarily an easy process or an easy way to, to sort of figure this one figure this one out. Because even they, the simple act of handing someone an I voted sticker. Uh, is going to have certain risks involved, much less uh, writing your ballot out and doing all of those other things or standing in line with, with people in, in, in closed rooms. So the question is, how do we make this a safer, better process? And really, as we do that, how do we get everybody more engaged in the democratic process? So this is really what I want to talk to you about. How do we protect Michigan voters? Um, and Voters Not Politicians has called this their, their vote safe project. And I really think it's a uh, it's a great name for a, for a really worthy, worthy project. And I'm going to run through it. And there are really f only four things that I want to talk about. Um, one of them a little bit longer than the other. So I really want to talk quickly, and this is nothing you don't know, but I want to talk about how uh, what we're going on impacts the, not only our voting, but the right to vote, um, what we can do about it, um, and talk about maybe some, some myths about the things that we can do about it that other people have raised. Uh, and then to talk about what's the, the next step and what BNP will do and what you can do to help BNP in that, in that process. So that's really where I want to go with this. Let's talk about the first thing about how it impacts our right to vote. Um, we've all seen, and uh, MLive did this really 
well done, but also really kind of terrifying infographic about the spread of this particular virus in the state of Michigan by county. Um, and the, you know, the number who've gotten sick and the, the number who've died is really, um, it's just disheartening and, and, and tragic. Um, and, you know, as the numbers have increased, uh, we've seen people change their behavior patterns, we've seen policy change, and, and it's really time to think about how we're going to deal with that in affecting the actual way that we, that we vote. And so, you know, as we think about this spread and as we think about the possibility that this could go further, um, we need to do something about it. So we've had all of these cases. At one point, we had the highest rate in the, in the country. Fortunately, with good policy, that's flattened out. Um, and we have one of the lower growth rates of any state in the, in the country, um, but it's still been a really serious thing and it's probably not over. Uh, and I hate to say that, but I think being realistic when we look at the situation where we're really not looking at four weeks, uh, we're looking at a, at a long time. Uh, until we have a vaccine, until there's something, if we have a vaccine, until we have that, this is something that's gonna be with us for a long time. Um, don't listen to me on that. Um, listen to the guy that everybody else listens to. And there's no guarantee that there's going to be a resurgence, but the people who study this for a living are pretty afraid, especially if we don't act adequately. And I think there's a real question about uh, whether we've been acting adequately. Um, that if we don't, there are going to be problems, and those problems are going to come back precisely at the time when the people of this country are going to be going to the poll. That's a problem. Uh, and it's a, it's a problem because uh, we've seen what can happen when uh, we have a COVID situation uh, and we've got uh, people trying to go out and vote. It really does threaten people's health and, and, and safety. We know how to stay safe, but we don't necessarily know how to stay safe, or at least it's not easy to stay safe and vote at the same, at the same time. Um, and we're going to face a hard choice. And it's not a choice that's unique to Michigan. I mean, it's a choice that they already faced uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, it, it didn't didn't turn out so well. Um, there are actually recorded cases from, um, from the election, uh, and there was simply a, a, a huge uh, chaotic period around that Wisconsin election that, that really does not speak to anyone's benefit. Uh, I think it's bad for, for all the elected officials, it's bad for democracy. Uh, and so our question really, our, our point, our argument is that, that we, don't, we shouldn't have to weigh our health against um, the ability to the ability to actually cast a ballot. So what can we do about that? Well, the answers aren't that complicated. They're just going to take some work and they're going to take some effort. Um, here's the good news. A lot of the things that we actually need to, uh, to deal with this pandemic were uh, done by the voters of Michigan because back in the 2016 election, uh, 2018 election, not only uh, did they uh, get rid of gerrymandering or develop a process for getting rid of gerrymandering, but they made voting a lot easier with Proposition 3. So thanks to all of the, those of you who worked not only on Prop 2, but on Prop 3. Um, what this means is that everybody has a constitutional right to vote by mail for no reason in the state of Michigan. So we already have laid the groundwork for a better voting situation in Michigan. We jumped from really low on the list to really high on the list. Um, we're not quite done yet, and that's, uh, and that's, that's the real issue. Um, the Vote at Home Institute, which is a really pretty remarkable group in Colorado, uh, has developed a, uh, a kind of ranking of the, the degree to which voting is easy um, from those states where you actually have to have an excuse uh, to get an absentee ballot. Some states that barely give any out at all um, to ones where you still need an excuse, but, but your age is enough to give you an exception to no excuse, to no excuse with a, with a permanent mail ballot option so that you, you regularly get those um, absentee requests and so on. We actually jumped in Michigan from pretty near the bottom of that list with Prop 3. We jumped to the pretty near the top, but we're really somewhere between level three and level four, uh, but we still got a ways to go for full voting at home. Uh, and so the question is, the task that we have in front of us is, is, is getting that done. The good news is, in addition to Prop 3, we're actually working on the, the problem itself, uh, and we've got state officials who are doing a really great job of, of moving this forward. So we have a governor who acted very quickly to, to issue an executive order so that everybody would get uh, a, a absentee voter application. Now, uh, most places in the state actually didn't have May 5 elections, but those that did, everybody got an absentee voter application. No questions asked, everybody got that application. 
Um, and our Secretary of State has really committed to not only doing that, but to making sure that this happens in August and November, uh, and also to implementing processes for making voting secure, more, more secure and easier. But that's not enough, and so that's our job as, as, as voting on politicians, because there's a lot that we need to do. And this is what you see in front of you, is just kind of a menu of things that, that, that need to happen. We need to have polling places that are safer and more accessible with safety procedures. That's gonna cost money. And I've been working with our local clerk, I live in Ferndale, to make sure that that happens. We've already had to relocate polling places away, for example, from a senior center, not a good place, to uh, um, expose uh, immunocompromised people during a voting period. Um, we also need to improve our systems for, um, for ballot tracking. We need to improve our, our in-person voting services. That's actually something voters and our politicians have been working on for a year um, to make sure that we can use those expanded hours so that people who want to vote in person can vote early. Um, we've got to make sure the process is done right. We're going to get a lot of absentee ballots in. Actually, one of my side jobs is to work as the, uh, the chair of an absentee precinct. Uh, in, in Ferndale, and so we're going to see a ton more ballots. A lot of these things need to happen. And then finally, there are things that are related to voting by, by, by mail, and those are the ones that I really want to talk to you about. To get those done, we really need to make sure that the legislature does some stuff, and I'm going to talk about that. That's where we got to go with all of this. So the one that I want to talk about in just a little bit of detail, about five minutes tops, um, is vote by mail. So among all of the various things, um, vote by mail is in some ways the most Controversial, it's also the most important. Uh, and it's it's really sad to me that it's the most controversial because voting by mail for a long time has not been a controversial thing at all. Um, since the time of the Civil War, it's been part and parcel of America's uh, voting uh, panoply, voting sort of menu of options. Uh, and so to see it become politicized uh, is really unfortunate, but that's where we are. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. You all have probably had an experience of vote by mail. I suspect many of you have, uh, have, have done it. And if we were here in person, I could get a show of hands and see. But I bet most of you have uh, either voted by mail or know people who have. It's a process, not terribly complicated. You get your application, you fill it out, you return it, you get your ballot, you fill it out, you return it. Um, and so we've been doing this in the United States for a long time. Um, and it's not just actually that you mail it in. There are a variety of other options that you can do. So you can return it. Many cities have a drop box where you can return it or you can return it directly to the clerk's office. That's what I actually did this year because I was working the absentee precinct. I had to vote early. Um, or you can get your absentee ballot and you can actually um, decide that you want to change your vote uh, and you can go and vote in person. So there's some a lot of options. A lot of people actually did that in the primary as people that they uh, uh, voted for uh, dropped out. So you can actually... Uh, I'll vote in person at, at, at clerk's offices, and so even before election election day. So this is what we've got right now, and voting by mail, as I said, is really a non-controversial part of American political life. It's so non-controversial that we we put uh, the voting of our military personnel, the people who serve us abroad, who protect our country. Ooh, we're frozen here, Kevin. Well, I think I can... Can, uh, can vote. So this is a regular part of our federal panoply. So not only did members of the military use it, uh, members of the uh, current administration use it as well. So you probably noted or you probably heard there are a variety of people uh, in American political life who, who, who use vote by mail. Um, these two and, and, and quite a few others. Uh, so this is a commonplace thing. A lot of people use it. A lot of people use it all the time. Um, and it's just a regular part of what we what we do. Furthermore, every single state allows by mail absentees. Um, and uh, some states require more excuses than others. It's something we, we, we say they require you to give a reason or, or an excuse. So those are the ones in lighter. But every single state allows it. Um, and it's part of our, our ordinary menu. Some states actually go even further. Uh, and some states actually make sure that ma ballots are mailed to everybody. So this is what we, we think of as the full vote by mail, where vote by mail isn't just an option for people to request it. It's actually part of the electoral system. It is built in electoral system. Um, really, the trend in the United States began uh, over 20 years ago in Oregon in 1998, but it was followed up uh, about a decade and a half later uh, by, in Washington, in, uh, in Colorado, in, uh, in Utah, actually. Utah rolled it out county by county, but now 98% of counties in, uh, in Utah uh, actually vote by mail. I think there's one holdout. Um, and then uh, in the last year, uh, we, we get two additions. So uh, uh, 
Hawaii passed it even before coronavirus, and then California added it um, uh, because of, of coronavirus. So six states in the United States vote by mail. That's the default way. Almost all of these allow a personal option for voting, but the default method is that everybody gets a ballot, uh, everybody fills it out, and they, they get it into their clerk in one way or another, either by mail or by dropping it off uh, or at voting centers and so on. But most people vote at home uh, in these states, the vast, vast majority do. But it's not just these, uh, these six states, uh, because there are a bunch of other states that use it for various reasons. So a bunch of states, and some eastern ones as well, including New Jersey, actually um, uh, have rural counties and regions that that's the default option for certain places is, is, is vote by mail. And a whole variety of other states actually allow it in certain kinds of elections. So referendums, local elections, and other, uh, other kinds of things. So uh, if you add it all together, 21 out of the 50 states in the United States um, have some sort of institutionalized vote by mail, where at least in some elections, everybody gets a ballot. Uh, six of those are statewide. Um, and you can see, if you look at it, just based on the results of past presidential elections, um, this is not a blue state thing. It's not a red state thing. It's not even a purple state thing. But that states across the political spectrum um, use this use this method. They tend to be out west, I think, probably because of the larger spaces and in some ways the, the different kinds of constitutions, different approaches to voting. But this is a this is something that is across the board uh, in the United States, where elections are simply done by mail. So. It's used across the country. It's used by servicemen. It's used by federal officials. You might start to wonder why we don't all use it. And, and one of the reasons is that there are a variety of questions that people have had. There are things that people raise. Well, what about this or what about that? And so I, what I wanted to do is just run through a couple of things that you may have heard about. And you've actually probably heard these responses. But I want to make sure that every single person uh, who's on this call knows that the, the kind of commonly raised objections to this are faulty and in many cases simply nonsense. Um, the first one is fraud um, and so you may have heard, I don't know who you would have heard it from, but you may have heard in recent days that uh, voting by mail opens the door to fraud. Um, rascalry, I don't remember what the exact word was. But, uh, yeah, it, you know, um, rascaldom, excuse me, yeah. So does it lead to rascaldom? No, it doesn't. I don't want to shout into my thing, but voter fraud doesn't simply doesn't happen in the United States. And it makes sense if you think about it. It's a punishable crime that doesn't change the outcome. You know, if you're if you're if you're voting twice or three times, you're increasing your chance of actually affecting the result of the election by one more in a million or one more in ten million. It just it's simply it, it's incredibly rare in the United States, uh, and it's even more rare in states that vote by vote, vote by mail. So. Um, uh, a professor at the uh, University, uh, uh, Washington University in, uh, in excuse me, University of, of, of Kentucky, uh, actually did an analysis of this. And we looked for cases of voter fraud and he actually used the Heritage Foundation, which is a fairly conservative foundation. He used their voter fraud database. Um, and what he found was that in per capita terms, um, voter fraud was actually uh, more likely in states that didn't use mail-in voting, limited absentee states, the ones that I showed before, um, than it was in states that use either no excuse absentee like Michigan or all mail like, like, like Oregon. The bigger takeaway though is if you look at this, if you look at the numbers, one in 740,000, one in 1. 1.6 million, it's incredibly rare. To give you a perspective of that, I was trying to think about what, how, you would, how, you would, uh, how you would sort of realize how big a number that is, one in 740,000. And the, the closest I could come to, and you can tell me if this is a good analogy, now, so I, I want everyone out there to count to one. Okay, one. One second is elapsed. So one in 740,000 is one second in 12 days. So if you think of that one second that just elapsed, and then think of the next 12 days of your life, that's how unusual voting fraud is. It does not happen in the United States, and it's no more likely, in fact, it's less likely in states that use all mail voting. Tell everyone you know that particular statistic, it's incredibly rare, and it's less rare, it, it, it's more rare where we use mail in ballot. Very simple. Second thing you may have heard is that this is simply a partisan plot, that it's biased, that it's biased in favor of some political parties, or that it's biased in favor of some some voters. Again, the answer is no. Um, one study that comes out hasn't been uh, hasn't been um, uh, 
peer reviewed yet, so it's, it's just a recent study, but I took a look at it and I looked at the methodology it was done by the Stanford Democracy and Polarization Lab, some pretty reputable people. Uh, and what they found was that voting by mail doesn't affect a party share of turnout or a party's vote share. And they did this in a really clever way that gives me a lot of faith in the procedure. They didn't compare state to state. What they did was to look at those three states uh, that actually rolled it out county by county. So where it didn't all happen at the same time. And that gives you a kind of slow rollout so you can look at how two similar counties compare to one another. So when they did this, when they looked at those similar counties, they found that it didn't affect who won or lost election. It did increase overall turnout, but it didn't affect who actually won the elections. And that's a big deal. It's not a partisan ploy. It's not some effort to win voters or to keep other parties from winning voters. It is simply a way of allowing people to vote safely without the risk of contracting a deadly virus. You may have also heard that it's, it's biased against some kind of voters. And often this comes from the sort of other side of the political spectrum. And there are some arguments that voting by home may benefit those who, who have regular access to mail, who have regular addresses and so on. Um, but the overall studies that have been done suggest that it doesn't disadvantage or advantage any particular set of ethnic groups or others. And in fact, um, for a variety of groups in the in the United States, uh, it would appear that that um, there are a variety of other problems that it, it actually solves. So um, voting fraud is one way that, that voting is affected, but voter intimidation, voting restrictions or others. And it turns out that actually voting by mail um, is a lot better for people who couldn't get off of work, who couldn't find the right polling place, who uh, were told they have the incorrect identification or were harassed or bothered. And it turns out that the people who experience those more, no surprise, um, are people of color in the United States. Uh, and so uh, by getting rid of those problems, voting by mail actually helps the population overall, um, regardless of, of the category. Last thing you might have heard is, well, maybe some states can do it, Oregon can do it, others, it's not right for Michigan, but actually we did this uh, in May and we did it really well. So 99% of all votes in May, for good reason, were cast uh, by mail. Um, what's amazing about that is it went fine. There were no major problems with, with counting or clerks, so we, we managed it really well. And amazingly, for these low turnout elections, turnout actually doubled compared to it gets voters out there. Again, it gets voters out there across the board, but it gets voters out there. It's a shame that it takes a, a pandemic for this to happen, but we found a method to get more people to vote. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. So in the big picture, vote by mail does the things we'd want it to do uh, and avoids doing the things we wouldn't want it to do. It's safe and it's cost effective. Um, and it's, it's really important. The procedure though that we have now is a kind of vote by mail since Proposition 3. It's no excuse Proposition 3. That's not what we need. Because what we need is actually to remove that top layer. Right now, there are six different interactions you have to have, and, and four of them, three of them that you have to have before you even get your ballot. What we need in the state is a simple vote by mail system like they have in Oregon or like they're going to have in California, uh, which is simply that everybody gets a ballot in the mail. They fill out the ballot, and they return it. That's what we need. That's what we need to make this work. That's going to have the full turnout effect and all of the other things. The question is, how do we get that? So we've got committed state officials who are, who are devoted to, to getting this done. The question is what the state legislature needs to do to, to get it in there. Because while the Secretary of State and the governor uh, can actually issue, um, they can send out uh, requests for absentee ballots, they can't actually send out the absentee ballots themselves without legislature approval. We also need the legislature to do a bunch of those other ballot security things and phone case security things. We need them to fund the system as well. But really, the legislature comes in by enacting laws that allow an Oregon-like system of voting at home, of, of voting by mail. And that's where we come in, we as, we as voters. The core principle of voters and our politicians, the core principle of the state of Michigan's constitution, it's in the first paragraph, is that all power is inherent in us. And this is something that we want. We want to be able to vote without contracting disease. We want to be able to vote um, in a way that maximizes turnout, whether that's Republicans or Democrats or independents, the, the vast majority of Americans want this. And so we need to actually take that next step. What does voters, not politicians, want you, need you to do? The first thing is they're going to be doing legislative outreach. So they're actually going to be talking to, uh, to uh, politicians. One of the, the amazing transitions that I've seen in voters, not politicians, is a transition from 
a group that collected signatures and petitions to a group that also works with legislators and others, realizing that not every political fight is going to be a petition fight. Uh, so as it's become a democracy promotion organization, it's also become one that works with legislators to get things done. So they're going to be doing that legislative outreach, but they're going to need your help to do that. Uh, and even before COVID, they set up a, a framework called Dial for Democracy, which gets all of us uh, to be able to call very simply with very concrete demands, very concrete requests uh, to dial our elected officials. And so that's something, and Tim and I can talk to you about how to join Dial for Democracy, but just as we're dialing for the census, we can dial for democracy. As long as we're going to be stuck at home, we might as well be reaching out to the world uh, writ large uh, and getting people to, to understand why this is so important. VNP is also going to be working using social media, using online petitions. They're going to be working through a variety of mechanisms that are the kinds of things that persuade policymakers to actually get things done. At the same time, we're going to need all of you to get out there and empower other people. Um, so you've got to get them, get people out there to let everybody you know that they can request a mailed ballot. Just like you got everybody out there that you knew to, to think about applying for the commission, you can now let everybody do, everybody know that they can get a mailed ballot. Even if we don't get the legislation, we need as many people to do this as possible. And we also need your help in holding accountable the, the people who stand in the way. Because this is gonna come to a vote and we're gonna know who is in favor of systems that allow us to vote uh, and to vote safely and who doesn't. And so we need to let our legislators know that. And when it comes time, we need to vote on this basis uh, to send a message that, that Michigan needs vote by mail and that Michigan is going to act on that if we don't get it. That's the big picture. Kim can, I'm sure, can flesh it out a lot more. Um, you can get more information if you text uh, vote safe to that particular number. You can visit the website. I went over my time, and I'm really sorry to use up uh, your, your beautiful evening. Um, but that's really what I wanted to talk to you about. And, and Kim and I would love to answer any questions you might have. Great. That was really good information, Kevin. Thank you so much. And let's Thank open you. it up now. Let's open it up now for, um, I'm sure people have questions. In fact, we've had a couple that have come through the chat box. Let's start, Kevin, with a point that was made that, and I hear this too, um, out on public media, social media, and so on, is that um, calling it absentee voting, there are people that are picking up on that and saying, well, absentee was meant for people who truly just can't get to the polls. And we should call it, um, you know, vote from home or, yep. you know, some of the other terminology. And would that help shift the thinking on it a little bit. It's a kind of a subtle difference that might make a difference. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's, and you know, at, at VNP, we're still talking about exactly how to, how to talk to people. We've been working with the, the Vote at Home Institute. Um, so there is this kind of tier of, um, uh, of level. So absentee voting is really something, it used to have a, something of a stigma to it. Um, it implies that you're not at home. Um, so voting by mail, uh, is a little bit broader and it sort of takes that stigma uh, away, but it still actually is uh, um, a slight misnomer because not everyone who's doing it is doing it uh, by mail. So in places like Colorado and Oregon, you vote at home, but you actually uh, can drop it off uh, at a ballot center um, and there are other options. So it actually is a little bit, a little bit bigger. So I, I think the, the semantics are something that, that we need to really, really think about. Um, whether you call it, I think, vote by mail or vote at home, I think either one of them is good. Um, uh, I, I kind of like vote, uh, vote at home, and we're still talking about that in VNP to see sort of what, what the, the phrasing. But if anyone has any thoughts or opinions on that, I guess actually there are thoughts and opinions on that, um, uh, that maybe vote at home is a good option. Uh, Jim Shettle, that question came from you. Is there anything you want to comment on on that topic? Um, you yeah, know, I, I, I like the, I like the, the answer there. I, I was, I was just kind of getting at the point where, you know, historically, uh, historically it's, you know, we've talked about absentee, uh, absentee voting and that, that, that's a old kind of terminology, but I like, uh, 
you know, and, and you hear it in, in, in the news stuff now too, but I, I really like what you're saying, Kevin, vote at home. I think that just has a great ring and, and uh, it appeals to all the, you, you know, demographics and so forth. So no, I, 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 yeah, I like vote at home, but, but I know the, you know, the media and the press are going to call it every which way, but, but I, but my initial comment was when you were putting up the post, the, the slide with, with Whitmer and, 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 and Bet Benson, and they were referring to AV. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's kind of the old, the old thinking in a sense. So yeah, no, right. I like vote at home. Yeah. Okay, I good. vote for vote at home. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Another question came from Karen. Um, Karen is looking for her application to arrive in the mail, said it hasn't come. Um, I'm speculating, Karen, that I know the mail has been a bit slow and maybe it's still on its way. Um, I don't know. Um, Kim or Kevin, have you heard anything about whether people are receiving their applications for a ballot? Yeah, I was on a call earlier today with a bunch of, with the panel, and some of those people were just getting their ballots, their ballot applications in the mail. And um, but, I wondered if it's because my township didn't have anything to vote on in May. Yeah. Right. Well, you would not have gotten one in May for that reason exactly, right. but you so. should get one. Everyone who's registered in the state of Michigan should be getting um, an application for an absentee ballot now. So it should be coming to you sometime very soon. Okay. Glenn, are you holding up your... Yes, we, your got, a couple, we got a couple of days ago. Okay. <laughs> so they're on their way. Yeah. And I wonder if they mailed the ones first to the people who had ballots coming up. Probably not. It may just be, and I think, Kim, do you know, are they doing this by, I think it's still local control, right? Like it's local, local organizations. Yes. So, you know, they're authorized to do it and they're, they're actually required to do it now. But, you know, different townships and cities have different timeframes on, on when they send things out. Okay. So I suspect, you know, I suspect that's what's going on. So, so this has two ballots. There are two ballots here. I mean, two uh, elections. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. It's wow. August, it's for November. August and November. Glenn, thanks There's, for sharing that. That's great to know. That'll actually help us when we talk about this. Okay. I haven't seen mine yet. No. There should be a spot on there where you can request to be on the permanent absentee list as well. Yep. That was going to be my next question. I'm not expecting to get this application because I'm on the permanent list. So I'm really curious to see if they filtered people like me out. Right, right. Probably, I mean, that's the advantage of doing, you know, about doing it at the local level is that, that clerks can make those kinds of decisions and save a couple stamps, so. Yeah. And this is where we're on the permanent uh, absentee um, list, but we got our, our um, absentee ballot request. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, you know something ago. else. You go ahead, Bob. It was about a week ago. Okay. Wow. Okay. With the application, and it covers both the elections. Got it. So I okay. think that this confusion that results from some people already being on the list and some people not, and it be coming to different people at different times depending on where they live, mm -hmm. is one of the reasons that we are advocating for ballots to be mailed directly to every yeah. voter. You know, it's much more straightforward. Mail everybody a ballot, and then you'll the the rates for for people actually participating in the process will rise. Right. Yeah. Um, I I put a link in the chat box, um, or you can find it on your own. If you go to the Secretary of State's website, you can find the application form there as well. If you prefer not to wait for it coming in the mail, or if it just for some reason doesn't arrive. I think Kevin, that one of the one of the questions that I'm definitely hearing, and it's a question that I asked when I first talked to Charlie Bial. Am I saying his name correctly at VMP about yep. vote saves? Yep, Beal. Charlie yeah. Beal is. Um, you know, I wondered how, like, what are the procedures for keeping voter rolls current? And you know, the fact that the signature verification has to be done between the ballot. So the city clerks will verify the signature between or compare the signature that on your ballot envelope with what they have on record at the Secretary of State's office. That's great. 
Um, so, so then my next question to him was, well, how, how exactly are those names and addresses being kept up to date? That's where people are going to be concerned that somebody died last month and they're still going to get a ballot and a family member could fill it out and sign it and send it in. Um, I, I really think that's where some legitimate concern might come from. And so we need to be able to answer that question. Now, two weeks from tonight, we're going to have the Oakland County Clerk on this call, and we'll talk about that. But um, Kevin and Kim, if there's anything that you want to comment on that, that might be helpful. It would be good to hear. Sure. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, I think, you know, so I think part of it is um, this is why we, we actually need a, a comprehensive legislative package, because those things you know, it's, I've never met a single clerk who doesn't want to do those things and they want the best records they can possibly get. Um, they cost money and take some time. Uh, and so, you know, those problems are going to exist in the current system or in the future, you know, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the absentee or the others, you're going to have those same kinds of problems that, that can emerge. I mean, it's just as simple to send back, you know, somebody's um, absentee request as it is to send in their um, their their actual their actual ballot. So there's nothing that's changing from this this system to the other one. Um, but what we need is that kind of broader commitment to making sure that this is happening. And what we've seen in the past is there are ways to, to do that um, that are, are nuanced and that make sure that you're not excluding people who are already who should be on the rolls. Um, uh, but those ways are expensive, whereas the, alter the alternative way is just to exclude people willy nilly like they've done in Ohio and Wisconsin and other places. Um, the, the reason they're excluding people may be to exclude people, but also it's just because it's cheap and therefore it's not particularly uh, nuanced and effective. So, I mean, if we're going to if we're going to base our system on 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 democracy, if we're going to decide that we actually want people to vote for who's in charge. Um, then we need to fund it in a way. And compared to everything else we spend money on, this is absolutely a minuscule expenditure. And we just need to commit to doing it. Kim, any thoughts? No, I completely agree. I completely agree. I know that right now it is really difficult to remove a voter from the rolls, right? To remove a voter's um, right to vote. And that's a good, that's a, that's a protection. Um, so, I mean, you know, but it's not illegal for an absentee ballot or a ballot to sit at somebody's house if the voter doesn't live there. That's okay. The only part where it's actually fraudulent is if somebody um, acts on that and votes with that ballot. And as we can see from the statistics, that doesn't happen. Right. It's extremely rare. I mean, Oregon's been doing this for 20 years, and there have been, I think, less than less than triple digits, so double digit problems with with you know, tens of millions of votes. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Okay, any other questions, anybody? Let me see if we're... Mary Jo, I had one in the chat. This is Drika. Yeah, Drika, would you go ahead and ask your question? Yes, I was wondering how the work that you're doing relates to the WAVE initiative, if at all. And wave if I can do the elevator speech on it. Yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, let's see if I can explain this to everybody else. It's a, an incredibly sophisticated piece of software that enables you to identify people who are leaning in the direction you want them to lean and have a tendency not to be a voter and encourage them to ask for and fill out an absentee ballot. Huh. So, you know, Voters Not Politicians has been really just unbelievably resolute in not being partisan. Um, I mean, the issues that they've been working on sometimes have a partisan bent one way or the other. Um, but uh, so, I mean, what, what you're talking about is probably the application of, of a similar kind of technology for, um, you know, for, for a particular party to do what parties do, which is to try and get as many voters as possible. Um, for VNP, the goal is to get as many people to vote absentee regardless of party, regardless of every single demographic or other indicator, just just to vote, just to do the democracy thing that we need to do better. Uh, the way people would say, I think that it could be used 
by anybody, but you're right. It's a very left-leaning, it's a left-leaning group sure. that's running it. Sure. And, you know, hey, good for them. And, you know, democracy works best when every side realizes that they need to get more voters out there. So, you know, if it's if it's a blue or a red or a purple, you know, whatever it takes to get voters out there, you know, that's my 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 goal. I care about some policy issues, but I also care at a much I think, deeper kind of meta level about making this system work, which is why I have to say, and if I can just why it's been so disheartening to see people talking about the system um, in a kind of disposable way to suggest that the system is riddled with flaws undermines people's confidence in one of the things that we do that works. One of the things that's good is now being savaged um, because, you know, I, well, I don't even want to speculate on why, but I think anything that any of you can do to let people know that voter fraud is incredibly rare, that the system works, um, that's got to be the, the, the basic, the core message. After that, everything, you know, we can talk about all the other policy things and so on, but this is not a fraudulent system. Elections are not rigged. They're not going to be rigged. Um, and uh, we just need to make sure that people can vote and not get sick. That's it. I'd like Amen. to add, yeah, I'd like to add something that I think um, adds to the conversation of the, the fact that voting by mail is favored by both parties yep. or by all parties. And here's evidence of that. You know, the, Donald Trump is trying to make people think that it were that people, there's a nefarious attempt to um, ca cause disfavor to his party. Well, his party sent application ballot applications to michigan voters before the march primary yeah yep. i received that how many of you got that it was a kind of a fourfold cardboard light cardboard i did yeah, yeah. and there's a political operative named rick wilson who is one of the founding members of the lincoln project um, this is a group of republicans who are um working to try to reclaim their party. I don't want to get into something partisan here. I just want to give you a little bit of background of who Rick Wilson is. He is a Republican. He said on a podcast just recently, do not let this, this notion of uh, fraud um, occurring with mail-in ballots, don't let it occur. Don't fall for it. Um, he said, as a Republican operative, he can tell you that it was always part of the Republican strategy to get early voting done, to get vote by mail done, everything that they could do just as the Democratic Party does. So when you, when any of us hear somebody talk about this, we need to be those voices saying it is used by both parties. We've gotten applications from both parties. It works. That's right. So that is part of the reason that we're working um, to hold, we, we've sent a questionnaire out to legislators and candidates asking what their stance is on this issue. And, you know, we want a pro-voting legislature. Yep. That is our goal. Whether they're Democrats or Republicans, we want them to be supportive of everybody voting and everybody voting safely. And part of our work is going to be to hold those politicians accountable. Um, so that's where we need the most help. We need everybody's help to make that happen. So sign up to volunteer, join us. Okay, everybody, thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank and you. This was great information, very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you for the good questions. Um, and I've got two other quick topics to cover. Kim and Kevin, you're welcome to stay if you would like for those. Um, I'm gonna go through the next two things fairly quickly. I'm going to stay, but I'm going to turn off my video. I'm going to go, I have to cook for my kids. So um, all right. thank, thank you all. Um, I look forward to listening to the rest. Thank you all so much for your time. If you have any questions or any thoughts, um, let Kim or I know Mary Jo has our email addresses. So we're happy to help with anything to spread the word. Yeah. All right. I second that. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. For the rest of our viewing audience... Um, 
Do you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, one of the subjects that we know is of interest to people is how to find who their representatives are. Um, and then, you know, that can serve as a basis for looking at candidates for the upcoming election cycles. So there are two sort of one-stop lookup uh, websites that I think are, are really great um, that I would like you to know about. This first one is myreps.datamade.us. The source of the information is a Google Civic Information API. That's all it is. So let me, um, let me go over here to, let me show you this website. Oops. Okay, so you see here in the address bar, I'm at myreps.datamade.us. It's a very simple website. It's, and just showing, it's showing your slide still. Oh, okay. This happens to me all the time. So I have to reshare. Okay. Yeah. So let me go to that. Okay. Do you see my reps? Yes. Okay. So this is the myreps.datamade.us website. I have keyed in my address and I'm going to click search. Now what it shows me, and again, this is a very simple format, but it shows me that I'm in Rochester Hills Ward 3. Here are my Oakland County um, Board of Commissioners. I'm in District 15. Here are the other Oakland County uh, people that are representing me. You see all the different roles, the sheriff, the county executive, the treasurer, um, uh, county clerk, my Oakland County Commissioner. Then it shows me my Michigan State Senator, my two US Senators, Governor, and so on. It's got the Supreme Court Justices. Who's on the Michigan State Board of Education? This is my Michigan State House Rep. And alongside of all of these are on contact buttons. So if I wanted to look up the address or other contact information for any of these people, I could do it there all in one place. So that's one way. Now, another thing that you can do is go to the League of Women Voters website. This is League of Women Voters Oakland area, specifically lwvoa.org. Do you all see my League of Women Voters screen? Yes. Okay. On this website, once you get there, you go to they represent you in the menu. And from there you pick your city or your village or your township. I'm gonna choose Rochester Hills because that's where I live. And it brings up this printable document that has the names of the people that represent me and their contact information right there. So you see the federal level, here are US senators. Now here, um, the Rochester Hills um, document covers, notice in the lower left of my screen right here, it's for Auburn Hills, Rochester, Rochester Hills, and the Charter Township of Oakland. So they've got some of these grouped into these printable documents. So because I chose Rochester Hills and I get this grouping, there are two US House representatives in, in that area. So I would have to know or figure out that I'm in the 8th District and Alyssa Slotkin is my rep. But both she and Haley Stevens appear here. So I've at least got it fairly narrowed down. Once I know who it is, all the contact information is there. Um, that is the case for um, other areas. So here you see the governor, uh, secretary of state, attorney general, state senators. Again, there are multiple state senators listed. I have to know that I'm in the 13th district. Mallory McMorrow is my representative. So 
once again, here it all is. Oakland County officials, school officials, um, at the local level, here's my city of Rochester Hills, mayor, city council, even the library board. Um, so if you're looking for a resource like this, here it is, and two different ways that you can find it. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Any questions about that? About that? Whoops. Okay, the next topic. Um, this being such an important election year, and really in any election year when we're looking for candidate information. Here are some go-to spots for you. Uh, the League of Women Voters has a lot of good candidate information on their website. Um, you go to League of Women Voters, lowv.org, and you can find information there. Um, and they specifically have a website called vote411.org uh, with a, a pretty user-friendly menu that you can use to delve down into uh, whatever area you're interested in in terms of candidates. Uh, there's also ballotpedia.org. A lot of good information there. And there's this website called votesmart.org. Uh, votesmart.org has excellent information about our current representatives and it also has a vote easy section that provides a really good tool for selecting candidates whose values align with yours. Um, I won't go into it tonight, but if you go to that website um, and you go into Vote Easy, you can first pick. You could start with, okay, I want to assess the presidential candidates or I want to assess the congressional candidates. And it gives you several categories, about eight different categories. Uh, might be campaign finance, it might be immigration, it might be um, money, money in politics, about eight different categories. And when you pick each category, it asks you questions and it gives you a few choices. And based on your answers to those choices, it starts showing you which candidate is more in alignment with your own values than the other. So take a look at that website and see if that would be something that would be useful to you. And then also, if, if you want to delve into um, issue areas, there are scorecards that are available through a number of organizations. For example, the Sierra Club, if, if you want to rate candidates based on where they stand on environmental issues and what kinds of decisions they might make on your behalf, with regard to water quality, air quality, climate change, and so on, Sierra Club is one of multiple organizations that you can go to find their scorecard. Um, they actually have scorecards for um, both current legislative matters and also for candidates. Um, another example, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. They will put out scorecards as we get closer to the election um, based on questionnaires that the candidates fill out that will help you see, oh, how are they leaning on um, the subject of gun controls? And you can make some decisions based on that. And then there are a number of other organizations that are associated with the issues that you care about. So find those and look to see if they have candidate scorecards or contact them and ask them if they've got scorecards that you can look at. So just a few tips on um, information that's available at our fingertips to help us um, be ready to vote, select candidates that are going to make decisions in alignment with our values. So any questions on any of that? No, okay. Okay, I'm Mary Jo Keith. Can you send the slides out when you're done, or to those who uh, are on here? Uh, yes, we can. I've been. I I think we've got a good list of who's on the call. I do. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll send these out. Yeah, there's a lot of good references there. Thank you. Yeah. We're, and there, I put some things in the chat box too. 
Um, we're hoping to have um, uh, the similar kind of event in the fall on specific issues. So we could hear from those organizations, some of them on uh, how ver various candidates positions on particular issues. Okay, then to close for tonight, we want to give you a preview of um, what's coming up at our next event. Just a moment here. Okay, next in our series on June 11, 7 o'clock p.m., our, the Oakland County Clerk, Lisa Brown, will be here. And for any of you who are on the call who are not in Oakland County, this information will be just as relevant for you. She knows that there will be people um, in our session from other counties. She's gonna talk about how citizens can support the election process, the all important topic of election security and safety, and um, answers to questions that we will give to her in advance and that you can ask during the call about mailing in ballots, and a host of other election topics. So mark your calendar for June 11th at seven o'clock p.m. So thank you for attending tonight. Uh, thank you to the social and environmental justice team at Birmingham Unitarian Church who has prepared uh, for these, for these um, forums. Thank you to our speakers and to all of you who attended. And Have thanks. a good night. Thank you, Mary Jo, for moderating. It's excellent. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good night, everyone. Night.